it's Lisa. Thanks. Uh -huh. Good to see everybody. I haven't been here in a while. <laughs> Um, Karen Garst has a PhD in Curriculum and Instruction from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a master's degree in French Literature from the same, and a BA in French from Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. She has served as a field representative for the Oregon Federation of Teachers, is the Executive Director of the Oregon Community College Association, and Executive Director of the Oregon State Bar. She is married and lives in Salem, Oregon and is a lot of fun when she gets a couple glasses of wine in her. <laughs> Karen Garst. I'm very pleased to be here. I want to first thank Lisa and Oliver uh, for the two glasses of wine she just mentioned. <laughs> um, they were gracious enough to host me last night, and Paul came over, and we just had a delightful time. It was more fun. Uh, so what I would like to do, what do I hit? There we go. Before I give the presentation from goddess to god, I would like to tell you a little bit how a little girl from Bismarck ended up signing books out there. Because every time I sign books, I go, how did I end up here? Who would have ever thought, growing up in Bismarck, North Dakota, I was going to write a book? Well, my husband and I, a lapsed Catholic from the start, his mother would drop him off, and he would go out the back door um, left going to a very liberal church about 20 years ago and never joined, never even knew there were humanist organizations or anything. And then in 2014, you remember, may remember a little Supreme Court decision called Hobby Lobby. Anyone remember that one? Yeah, yeah. Well, two days after that, I was having lunch with a friend of mine who's an author. And she said, Ken, you should write a book. And I said, well, the only thing I can get pissed about is religion. So um, I probably should have said passionate about it. Anyway. Um, so I decided to write a book, and I started to call friends of mine. Or you, you know, I knew who was an atheist and who wasn't. And some said, oh, yeah, I'd love to write one. And then a friend of mine said, ah, you know, I was a secular Jew. I really don't think much of it. But you have to meet Dr. Peter Boghossian. Does anyone know Peter? Great. And he lives in Portland, and he introduced me. And Peter loves sushi. So I ply him with sushi lunches, and he makes connections for me, so it's great. He got Richard Dawkins to um, do a blurb for my book, and he's just introduced me to everybody, so it's been wonderful. Um, so this book, uh, then I started to join the other humanist groups to secure authors, et cetera. And then when I secured a publisher, I went a little broader to have a little more diversity. And Aran Ra. For example, his um, wife, Lalandra, is one of my authors. So I got to meet a lot of new people that way, too. And each of these women tell their stories of leaving religion. And it's really fun to contrast some of them who were raised in a fundamentalist community to a really good friend of mine who was born in England. And she says, in England, uh, when you ask directions, they tell you it's near the Lucky Lab pub. <laughs> And she moved to the United States, and they say it's next to the Methodist church. Huh? What? I don't know where the Methodist church is. How am I going to find that place? And when she was in school, they said grace. And she had no idea what grace was. So who's grace? Who's grace? They're talking about grace all the time. And that's the title of her essay. But a lot of these essays are women who had pretty traumatic experience coming out of religion. And I want to read one from Ann Wilcox. The problem is my mind, my heart, and my will were the fundamental tools I needed for knowing myself, for connecting with other humans, for making wise choices, for having empathy and showing compassion, for setting clear boundaries, for living a whole and satisfying life. But when my religion demanded I believe things that were irrational, mythical, or contrary to human decency, it had to undermine or destroy these fundamental tools. What else would they have done? If they hadn't bent my mind, I might have wondered why there are such an amazing number of things in the Bible that make no sense. If they hadn't suppressed my feelings, I might have decided that human compassion is more important than obedience to dogma. And I might have rebelled at being commanded to love a being who sends billions of people to hell. 
So I hope that gives you just a little taste of the book. And I do have copies of the book for sale afterwards, and I'm happy to sign them. I really appreciate it. When I started to write the book, I contacted and employed a marketing guy. And uh, he said, well, you can't just write a book. You know, you have to do all the social media stuff. I said, what? Social what? <laughs> and so um, he helped me set up a blog, which I write every week. And there are cards out there. If you don't want to write it down, you just take a card and you've got it. Uh, and I love guest posts. I think every blogger would love a guest post because that's the week you can take off. So if anyone wants to write about their story or it's a particular issue, I focus on women and, and religion, um, I would be happy. My email's there. Uh, the blog's listed. And I do have a YouTube channel. It's just Google the Faithless Feminist and you come up with me. And I'm going to start a series of 10 takeaways because when I started this project, um, you may have noticed I went to a Lutheran college <laughs> and, you know, learned a lot in my course in religion, actually. I couldn't believe they talked about the different oral strains of the Old Testament. What? You know, it wasn't written by God. <laughs> it was written by different, these different people. Uh, I decided to read, and I probably read 150 books in the last two years. And because I'm a little older, I took notes on those. So in order to relearn them, I'm going to do 10 takeaways from each of those books and put them up on my uh, YouTube channel. And so if you say, God, I don't know if I want to buy that book, um, check there and take a look at that and you can see whether you're interested based on probably a 10 to 15 minute video. Okay, so we will have time for questions at the end, either on what I've already told you or on the slide presentation. When I started reading about religion, I started to read books about, well, what happened before monotheism? What was that like? And at the end of this slideshow is a bibliography. And if you miss it, I'll be happy to send it to you. Just email me. And I became very interested in that and decided to do a presentation uh, so that I can come to groups like yours and talk about that. And please, feel free to ask questions. If you want to make a comment later on, email me. I'm happy to take a look at it. And if you find an error, which people have, Please let me know. So let's get started. From goddess to God. We all know from our, does anyone remember their senior high school mythology class? Okay. There were pantheons of gods, the Greek gods. And then the Romans said, God, that's a lot of work. We're just going to borrow yours. We'll change the names. Okay, that works. So nobody disagrees about that. Nobody disagrees that Judaism is probably one of the longest lasting monotheistic religion and those that followed. And that Christianity is based on well, uh, Western culture. It's embedded in Western culture. Uh, if you go back to this recent election, did, did you hear about religion a little bit during? Yeah, during it. Good. And so what I want to focus on what is the impact of having a goddess to worship, either alone or with a god, and then having that completely eliminated? So that's what we're going to talk about today. The role of culture is something you really have to unpack. I think it's really curious. I never went into academia, but I had a great time in Madison, Wisconsin in the 70s. It was cool. I did my dissertation on Pierre Bourdieu. My major advisor asked me to do that because I speak French. And he was a sociologist of education. He came up with a word called habitus, H-A-B-I-T-U-S. And he said that's everything that influences you from when you're young to when you're older. It could be your race. It could be your economic status. It could be the country you live in. It could be your language. And of course, your religion. And so I think it's interesting, 40 years later, <laughs> I'm coming back to talk about cultural reproduction. And obviously, religion is a key component and has been for thousands of years. I maintain that religion is the last cultural barrier to gender equality. <coughs> Keelan Ullinger, who wrote a book, Gods, Goddesses, 
and images of God in ancient Israel said, humans need a cultural system in order to endure because such a system is necessary and because it compensates for a deficit in natural instinct, individuals and society, societies regard their own specific system as natural and virtually necessary. That's just how we learn and how we grew up. Religion has been one very strong component of culture for thousands of years. Until the United States was formed, religion was the same as government and the same as power in any society in which it existed. So how does culture reproduce itself? First of all, spoken language. Now I generally say 100,000 years ago, somebody came up to me at my book launch and said, well, you know, there are people like Noam Chomsky who say there was some evidence of a larynx way, way before that. So will we ever know? I don't know. But at least by 100,000 years ago, there was language. And what did that permit us to do? Instead of showing things, we got to tell things. And we got to tell our children about their grandparents. And we got to talk to other people. That ability to communicate with spoken language is huge. Then there's music, which arose probably 55,000 years ago in Africa. And we know it's still <laughs> here today. And my sister and I were in a car for an hour, and we decided to sing all the songs we grew up with church. And you know, even though I'm an atheist, singing Onward Christian Soldiers, it touched something in me. I mean, sometimes I'll even put on the CD for the Messiah and start singing along with that. So this is deep roots, and it's touched us. And I had the pleasure of meeting Paul. And um, we're going to exploit his talent. I'm working, I'm an, on the advisory board of the Atheist Alliance of America, and we're going to eventually get a Good Without God concert and have people like Paul, um, Shelley Siegel, and others start to create a genre of music for us, too. Rituals. Another thing that keeps us tied into that church community, tied into religion, is rituals. Because you perform them over and over again, and there's an emptiness when they're not there. Uh, I was telling Paul and Lisa and Oliver last night when my brother, who since passed away, and my sister and I used to get together, we would, we would line up like we did in youth choir and go, God's word is our great heritage. And it was so cool because we got to walk down that church aisle. Where do you have pomp and circumstance in your lives today? So... It's something that gets embedded in us, and we, we have trouble even eliminating it. What do I miss? What am I missing? What's, what, what would I like to have that I had before? And then, of course, art. And we're going to talk a lot about art today. And art arose probably 30,000 years ago. That's our earliest evidence for it in the caves, in France, in Lascaux, and places like that. Writing arose about 3,000 BCE in Mesopotamia, and it was used primarily to keep track of supplies, trading, and different things like that. And we know how much influence that has. When Muhammad decided to write the Quran, he knew the Jews had the book. He knew Christianity had the book. And he needed to have a book, because they did, and he was competing with them. So we're going to talk a little bit about the mother goddess. Prior to the 60s, uh, archaeologists were mostly men. So there are thousands of figurines in Neolithic and Paleolithic sites, and frankly, they didn't give them a lot of attention. But in the 60s, women came into these fields, people like Marija Gimbutas, who looked at these differently. And she may have gone over a little overboard. She does have some criticism from what she's done. But she worked very closely with James Mellart in some of these excavations in Turkey. And she also, she had a lot of support from Joseph Campbell. And they came up with some new hypotheses. So we're going to look at those today. This is the Venus of Lozal. You notice, uh, this is a woman, right? Got that, OK. She's holding a, a horn. Now, that horn could be a symbol of the, of the crescent moon. It could be a cornucopia. 
there are 13 lines in that. 25,000 years ago, they knew that the moon had 13 cycles. And how amazing do you think it was for them to know that the moon had 13 cycles and so did women? Like, wow, <laughs> why did they have their period 13 times just like the moon? Wow, that must, that's really cool. And there are a number of these carvings, art, et cetera, which leads me to believe there was some veneration of the female. Maybe it was they moved the tribe forward. They're the ones that have the children. And we could debate when they first figured out um, the role the man had <laughs> and how that worked out, et cetera. But early on, of course, they didn't. But if there wouldn't have been children, they wouldn't have continued the tribe. And this is the Venus of Le Peugne, uh, again, a little later in France. I had somebody at one of my talks said, well, how do you know they were about worshiping women or worship of the goddess? Maybe they were just little toys. And I said, OK. <laughs> um, we'll probably never know what they did with them. Uh, but a lot of them are this fecundity, these large breasts, the large buttocks. And maybe that meant when things are that way, um, the tribe is doing well. I mean, they didn't really do skinny little things, which they must have run into in times of famine. This is a mother goddess. Some think she's giving birth, but look, she's got lions, a symbol of um, some kind of status in the community. She looks like she may have something on top of her head. And this particular figurine was found in Chattel Hoyek, where they've done a lot of excavations. And I would, if I ever had a chance to go to Turkey again, that is where I would want to go. She was found in a grain bin. So if you want a good harvest, <laughs> this is who you look to. So I think it's really possible that there was worship of a female entity. Uh, we don't know if it was alone whether it was conjunction with a male deity. And for me, that's not really important. I don't want to go back and worship a female goddess. I'm not interested in doing that. But I'm really interested in knowing how we got to a single male deity and the impact it has on our culture today. Um, this is another one with nine stripes. Nobody needs to tell you what that means. The snake has often been associated in a variety of cultures with a goddess. Why? The snake rejuvenates. We're going to talk a little later about cycles. Loses its skin. It hibernates. It comes back. But in a lot of cultures, we see the snake. And then we're going to talk a little later about Genesis. What happened to that snake? This is a, a goddess. We're not sure whether this is somebody who is coming to talk to her. Could this be a god? We don't know. What do we have on the left side of the picture? A snake. What do we have in the middle? A tree. We're going to talk about that tree in Genesis, too. A lot of these female goddesses later on, when we do have some historical information, were part of nature and worshipped in nature. There's a goddess in the Old Testament called Asherah, a Canaanite goddess. And Asherah can either mean the goddess, or it can mean this pole. So trees. Trees very closely associated with the goddess. Now, are you going to mess with her? I don't think so. I mean, this woman is cool. She's got, I don't know, is that a cat or a bird on top of her head? She's holding up the snakes. She's got seven layers in her skirt, and that's either seven days of the week or the sun and moon and the five known planets. But tell me she didn't have some rights as a woman to have this part of their culture. And in Crete, there was much more worship of the goddess, and it lasted longer pretty much than everywhere else. And then this, again, is in Crete. I don't know why the monkey's coming up to her, but <laughs> somebody else is bringing her something. She clearly has some, some sense of authority. And this is, was on a fresco. Now we're starting to be the time. This is a little before the Israelites came into Canaan or were developed. But these branch goddesses, again, Nature, tree, were associated. And we have evidence of that that far back. And then these clay pillars, 
uh, people will say the Israelites came in maybe 1200 BCE, 1500 BCE, but we know by that time, clearly, they were promoting um, worship of Yahweh. And where are these pillars found? They're found at home. They're found in little niches where people, you know, didn't generally go to the temple like people go to church. The priests were in the temple, right? Um, but they would go home. Maybe they would have a, I don't know if they had candles, little candle, a <laughs> little incense or something like that. Um, so they were home um, personal uh, symbols, if you will. I was in the British Museum a couple years ago and saw these. They're this big. <laughs> they're teeny, they're teeny little things, and they find them all over. They're still finding them. What do we have today? What's, if you ask a doc, next time you go to a doctor, ask him, why do you have a snake as a symbol? Well, the snake's associated with the goddess. The goddess is associated with healing because the women were the gatherers. They found out what plants did. And we know throughout history there were several times trying to get rid of the healers, the witches that were killed, the Malleus Maleficarum, which the church promulgated. And here's what a witch is. When the American Medical Association formed, they tried to get at the women healers, the midwives, because they were taking their job. So it's interesting that thousands of years later, we still have a snake. How enduring is culture to have that still be part of the caduceus? So what have we learned? Uh, Richard Dawkins coined this word memes, like genes, which are pieces of culture that continue, so we can talk about those. So what are the memes of the goddess? One, we have images. What happened with Judaism? Second Amendment, no graven images. Jews today have no images. The Christian church came along, no images. And then Pope Gregory in the sixth century said, all these people are illiterate. They're not getting the stories. I have to do images and basically overrule the Second Amendment and started to have images. Now, of course, they were the Virgin Mary and the Virgin Mary with her son, etc. But they were still images today. Um, we had stained glass windows in Trinity Lutheran Church in Bismarck. And I didn't realize till fourth grade when I got glasses, they were actually pictures. <laughs> I just thought they were glass. But here we had the pictures, even in the 1950s, of telling us the story. Mother-child birth, obviously, are key components. Healing with nature, I talked a little bit about the women gathering. And cycles, a key issue with goddesses is the cycle. They are here on Earth. They are part of Earth. Death and life go together. They're not separate. There's not something happening over there. It's all happening right here. And the goddess is part of creation. It's not something she does over there. She's part of it. And we'll see how that contrasts. So then it was all downhill from there uh, <laughs> with the advent of a male deity. When agriculture developed and herding developed, there was a notion of private property. This is my field. I need to defend it against that tribe who's coming. And what do I want to do? I want to pass it on to my son. So all of those things, I have to know my wife's a virgin. I have to know she's not committing adultery. All of those things stem from private property. So it's kind of all downhill after agriculture. Invasions. There are some theories that the people who became the Israelites um, may have been influenced by Marie Jagim Buddhist calls them Kurgans. They could have come from the desert. And they had a sky god. First of all, it started with a god on the mountaintop. And then as they got on top of the mountain, didn't find God, then it was in the sky, separated out. Goddess and goddess were together for a while. You know, these people came in, had a god. Well, we'll just incorporate the goddesses, no problem. They coexist. And then the male deity assumes a greater and greater role. We have more militaries. It unites people. And what better way to kill the other tribe than saying they don't believe in the right god? You know, they're heathens. Let's kill them. We still have that today. Cities are fortified. The government becomes who's in charge, the power, the priest, the temple, everything is united. So we develop monotheism. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the origin, oops, talk about the origins. There are several theories about where the Israelites came from. Did they come from the, um, what's now Saudi Arabia? They, they didn't come from Egypt. There was no sojourn in Egypt. There's absolutely no evidence. And the Egyptians were meticulous record keepers. Uh, there is some theory that they may have come from Midian. Moses married a Midianite. And they had a god which had two or three of those letters in Yahweh. So that's a possibility as well. Or they could have been Canaanites. There were a lot of people attacking the shore of Canaan. So these people may have been villagers in Canaan that went up to the highlands that weren't occupied to be safer. So there's a lot you can read about that. There's no um, definitive answer. Even in the Bible, <laughs> there's reference to more than one God. God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. It wasn't monotheism to start out with. It probably took, according to Karen Armstrong, who a, writes a great deal about religion, a former nun, it took 600 years to really impose that single God. Now, kingdom of Israel, there was a northern and a southern kingdom. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom was attacked by Assyria. Those are the 10 lost tribes, if you've heard of that. And they were assimilated into other cultures. They did not maintain the monotheism. They did not maintain the worship of Yahweh. And then we have the kingdom of Judah in the south. This is interesting. This is a picture from a pot. We call them pot sherds. And written on the top, see these little letters here? Yahweh and his Asherah. And so there are some people who surmise that Yahweh had a wife, and it was Asherah. There's a word in Hebrew called Elohim, and it's one of the words for God. El was a Canaanite god as well. So they're incorporating that culture of Canaan. They're incorporating what they have. So there's quite a bit of debate about what this really means, but I think it's interesting. The seventh century, they're still railing against pagan gods. Jeremiah 44, I want to read this to you. Then all the men who knew that their wives were burning incense to other gods, along with all the women who were present, a large assembly, and all the people living in Lower and Upper Egypt said to Jeremiah, we will not listen to the message you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord. We will certainly do everything we said we would. We will burn incense to the queen of heaven and we'll pour out drink offerings to her just as we and our fathers, our kings and our officials did in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. At that time we had plenty of food and we were well off and suffered no harm. But ever since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have had nothing and have been perishing by sword and famine. You probably didn't hear this in Sunday school. <laughs> the queen of heaven was the goddess Anath who is the mother of Asherah. Even in 722 BCE, when the northern kingdom disappeared, there were these figurines all over, because they can date them to that destruction. Manasseh, the king of Judah, was putting cult objects as late as 642 into the temple in Jerusalem. So if anyone tells you it's always been monotheistic, no, and there's a lot of evidence in the Bible against it. Josiah in 609 BCE was doing reforms, he was still destroying cult sites in Bethel. So in 598 BCE, I was amazed at my first course in religion in Concordia College to realize that this was a real event. There was historical evidence for it, and I thought that was really fascinating. So the Israelites, they took the, the scribes, the writers, the leaders, etc., off with them. Nebuchadnezzar came in concert, took them with, figured that once I conquered them, and I brought these people, I wouldn't have any more problems. Well, he did have problems, and he went back and destroyed the, the first temple. So they're in Babylon, and they're going, yeah, our God, we lost. You know, what's wrong? How did we lose? Look at these people. They have a, they have a male God, and they have a soul deity. Maybe we should do that. So I want to tell you the story of Babylon and their myth called Enuma Elish. Marduk, he's one of the bros. <laughs> and he goes to the other bros and says, hey, 
you make me head God. I'm going to get rid of that woman, Tiamat, that sea monster who's the goddess. You put me in charge, and I'll get rid of her. And they go, okay, sure, Marduk. Yeah, that's good. We'll do that. And so they hear this story, and they go, that's it. We need to get rid of every reference to Asherah, every reference to a goddess. It's going to be a single male deity. It's hard for me to believe that the decades they spent in Babylon, they weren't influenced by that culture. And then by 586 BC, they finalized the first um, books of the Bible. So let's take a look at when we got to monotheism and we got that single male god, what happened? Demonizing the feminine in the Old Testament. Eve, what do we see here? A snake? <laughs> a tree? What better way to put down the worship of Asherah and the goddess than using all her symbols in a negative manner? The red tent. Are you familiar with the red tent? Women were unclean. They were dirty. And when they had their period, they had to go into a red tent. When our son was young, I was reading a book called The Red Tent, and I was telling my husband about this. I said, yeah, the women had to spend their... Um, their week having their period in a tent, and he said, well, that sounds like a good idea. I said, I don't think they took the children with them. He said, well, never mind. <laughs> but because women were unclean, because they were dirty, today the Catholic Church has no women priests. It dates that far back. They're unclean. They're dirty. Adultery. I talked earlier about private property. You can't have adultery because then you are passing your land onto a son that you don't know if it's your son. And that's why there's so much talk about adultery and there's so much punishment for it. And more so on the woman. The man can have a harem. You know, Solomon had 200 wives. No problem. But a woman can. This to me is a pivotal point, the near sacrifice of Isaac. First of all, the man, Abraham, is willing to sacrifice his son to the God a God that doesn't have a mother and father, a God at this point doesn't have children, and he's willing to sacrifice Isaac. He doesn't sacrifice Isaac because God comes and gives him a goat instead. Where is Sarah, his wife? Is she consulted? Is she in this picture? No, absolutely not. He was in control. There's another story in the Bible about Jephthah. Jephthah says, God, if you let me beat the Ammonites, I, I promise I'll give you the first person who walks out of my house. He wins. He goes back. Who walks out of his house? His virgin daughter. Does God intervene and say, oh, no, Jephthah, that's okay. You don't have to sacrifice your daughter. No, he kills his daughter. Just a little difference in treatment. So what are the memes of monotheism, and how do they differ? One deity, male. The divine is separate from creation. God creates from above. It's not part of this world as the goddess was. Written laws instead of relationships. And written language replaces images. There's a book by Lawrence Schlein called The Alphabet and the Goddess, where he talks about the difference in spoken language and written language and how that changes our notion of time from cycles to something linear. I mean, it's really fascinating. So linear time replaces cyclical time, and eventually we get the hereafter. There was no hereafter before. And we focus on a spiritual existence. So what does this have anything to do with women today? Let's talk about that. There's a UN convention that 186 out of 193 countries have signed against the discrimination of women. Now, some of them who have signed it aren't doing a great job, I will admit. We haven't even signed it. Women heads of state. The only positive thing about the election of Trump is I didn't have to change the slide. <laughs> I was really searching. I was really searching. 52 countries in the last 50 years. I wrote a blog post. The, uh, no, it was an article I was trying to get published. Where's, when are we going to have our Cleopatra? 2,000 years ago, Egypt had a female pharaoh. She was in charge. The, probably the first female um, pharaoh was 1600 BCE. And we still don't have a woman leader. I want a Cleopatra. Now, I want a democratically elected Cleopatra, but still, you get the point. 
188 countries have paid leave, but not us. Wage equality, who's first? What is one of the most, the least religious countries? Iceland. Christians didn't come to try to convert them until 1000 AD. And they said, we probably should trade with them. Okay, we'll buy into that, but they never bought into it. They kept all their myths and all their, um, I was in Iceland a few years ago, and they have beautiful myths and stories. Um, so because they were the latest, they were probably the first to let go of it. We're 65th, 65th. So when people tell you, well, I don't know why you're a feminist. We have everything's equal for us. It's not. When my marketing guy suggested a name for my blog, the first thing he came up with, Godless Grandmother. I said, could we not emphasize how old I am, please? And he came up with Faithless Feminist. I was amazed, because I grew up in the 60s and 70s. That was a good word, right? It meant gender equality. There's a lot of pushback against that word today. And you can go on YouTube and <laughs> find out a lot of stuff about it. It's really fascinating. So I uh, want to say thanks to Corey Van Hoosen, who did the slides for me and helped me a great deal. Give him a little plug here. And the card has all this information if you want to take it. This is just a short bibliography of some of the things I used for that. So now I would like to stop and answer any questions you have. And thank you for your time. Any questions? Oh, you've got to have some questions. Yes. What are the menstruation cycles for women who get to the moon? Uh, menstruation. They're actually, you think of a monthly cycle, but it's 28 days, so it comes out to 13. And I've done some research, there's nothing definitive, but I remember in college that the women, after four or five months, started to have their periods at the same time. This was, you know, before birth control or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's interesting, why are there 13 cycles for menstruation and 13 for the moon? Maybe someday somebody will do some research for that and figure that one out. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have any uh, questions, uh, please come up to the mic up here so that we can get it all recorded. Somebody's coming up over here. Can you come up? I was just curious why you stopped where you did instead of going on to the New Testament. Uh, I have thought about doing another slide presentation on that. You know, probably the length. Um, I did in my book that's for sale out here write an appendix, and it's called The Subjugation of Women in Judeo Christianity. And I reread the entire Bible and wrote down every single mention of women, and I've used that um, there. So if you do, you will, you will see that. I'm, I'm working on developing another presentation, particularly for those I've already, who've already heard this, to move forward, because there is a wealth of material in that. Okay, I was just surprised that it seemed to stop suddenly. I wondered why you didn't get to Jesus. <laughs> Mostly about attention span. You know, <laughs> you don't want to be you don't want to be too long. I don't want to bore you. Uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting uh, presentation. You briefly touched on uh, agri the development of agriculture as the genesis of, I guess, fast forward to today, uh, private property rights to the point where you know multinational corporations. <laughs> own the world, mm -hmm. basically. Um, I know, uh, not being uh, an anthropologist, that there's a lot of controversy about the development of agriculture as a critical development mm -hmm. to you know, modern civilization. Uh, and I found it interesting that you briefly alluded to it in kind of a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could say a little more about that controversy. Well, I, I remember reading a book uh, that talked about how do you organize people to fight somebody else? And if you're a hunter-gatherer society, you're not going to do a lot of that. You're more subsistence. You're going from place to place, and you probably don't encounter a lot of other people, or certainly other tribes, as you will. And if you anthropologists look at hunter-gatherer societies today that still exist, they're much more egalitarian. The Iroquois, for example, the Hopi. So I think there's some evidence that there was 
once you get private property and then have to defend it. Plus, you get people together in the same place, and you're going to have to decide who gets the surplus of this field. What are we going to do? How are we going to trade? And so that really starts this notion of who's in charge. And at the time, the religion, politics, everything, it wasn't separate. It was all together. So you start seeing temples um, very, very early on after the development of agriculture. So I would maintain that that sedentary nature of being in one place and having to guard your sheep and guard your cattle and defend them against somebody else um, certainly had a huge impact. Any other questions? I guess as a follow-up then, what, um, what can we learn from that in terms of transforming our, our society today into a more cooperative uh, system now that we don't have this uh, such a problem of scarce resources where I think it's more a problem of distribution rather than actual scarcity how do we incorporate this knowledge to uh, get away from that you know competitive uh, warlike patriarchal mentality well, I think it's really interesting to see what happened in World War II. And what we did with the Marshall Plan, which was to go back and help our enemies and help our allies and help them rebuild. Who is one of our chief allies today? Germany. Who's another chief ally? Japan. So what we do is try to work with people who are different than we are. I do not believe we'll get into a peaceful state until religion is gone. Religion is one of the key issues of why we fight people. Because it's so much easier to objectify somebody and to say that it's OK to kill them if they believe in a different God. And we certainly see that today. We heard that during the campaign. We don't want any Muslims here. If I could wave a magic wand and get rid of religion, yeah, we'd come up with other reasons to fight. But I really think we need to. We're not going to survive unless we become more cooperative with each other and understand we have more in common than we're different. But I'm not real optimistic. I have a, a confirmation comment and a question. So first, my husband and I spent two and a half weeks at Standing Rock. Mm. When the women are on their periods, they call it their moon time. And historically, the women in their moon time spent the time in their teepees doing crafts. So it ties into your red tent. Sounds like a good deal. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> They're still doing this today. It's fascinating. Uh, my question is, though, you said these are the nine stripes, and you all know what this is. I have to admit ignorance. I don't know what the nine stripes The are. nine months of pregnancy. Ah. She's pregnant, okay. so it's a nine months of pregnancy. And the seven? The seven on the skirt could be the seven days of the week, or could be the sun, the moon, and the five planets that they knew at that time. Any other questions? Oh. If you have a comment or a question, please come up to the I, mic. I just had a quick. <clears throat> I just had a quick question about the uh, the quote that you gave from Jeremiah. Uh, as you know, there's several different versions of Jeremiah 1, the Septuagint versus the Masoretic text. Can you speak to whether you think the passage you read was like the Hebrew version or the Greek version, and whether you think that was, you know, what was originally said or, you know, because some of that's changed over the course of time. And then also, I just wanted to ask about Esther uh, and other books of the Bible where, you know, it seems like the woman is more of the focus. I mean, you gave some negative mm -hmm. examples yeah. like Sarah where she wasn't, <clears throat> part of the picture, but then there's other areas, you know, where the woman is the center of the story. So I'm wondering if you, if, if you think or if you can give an example of, of a place in the Bible, in the canon, where uh, the woman is not only a part of the, the story but the center and maybe something positive as opposed to negative comes about. I think there are examples. I think the negative examples overwhelm them, but Deborah certainly was a leader and fought other tribes, et cetera, on behalf of Israel. In the New Testament, you read about Priscilla. She was somebody who had people into her house, because the early community who were 
Jesus followers, let's call it that. I don't think we can call it Christianity at that point in time. They met in people's houses, and there were a lot of women involved. However, it didn't take long for people like Augustine, Tertullian, etc., to totally eliminate that influence. So I do think there are examples there. The first one on Jeremiah, I don't know. I will have to check on that. Um, there are a lot of translation issues. I was having lunch with a friend of mine who's a Christian apologist, and she said, did you know there are 300 predictions in the Old Testament that come true in the New Testament? Oh, I said, really? I said, well, you know, the one about the virgin birth, um, that is a mistranslation of the word Alma in Hebrew. And it actually means young woman. And now the New International Version says woman instead of virgin. Well, there's 299 then. I didn't have time to go through with all of them. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I think I just remember, I was thinking of when the um, Christians came and conquered a lot of um, the Native American tribes and other pagans and stuff, seems like what they, they took their goddesses and demoted them to saints. You know, they, for sort of like transitional period. Seems, is that kind of part of it? Well, I think what you do with culture is, is if you've got a group that you're trying to convince of something else and they have a set of rituals, you want to incorporate them. What is December 25th? It's a Roman holiday of Saturnalia. What is Easter? Easter is the spring equinox and the fertility cult. So you do want to replicate something like that. And repeat your question again, will you? I didn't catch the end of it. Well, is it basically um, a lot of the, like the like, Oh, the saints, yes. Yeah, they just kind of demoted all the women and other things down to make one god and a bunch of like lesser people. Yeah, and when Martin Luther came along with the Protestant Reformation, he got rid of the Virgin Mary and he got rid of all the, all the female saints. But one thing they did was they would incorporate these stories. I wrote a blog about uh, Regamund, who was this grain goddess. And she comes up to this field, and men are chasing her. And she says to the farmer, tell them I came when the seeds were planted. OK, he doesn't have to lie. She leaves, and the crops are grown automatically. So when the men come chasing her, she says, have you seen Regamund? Have you seen Regamund? Uh, no. She came when the seeds were planted. And this has been transformed into the saint. Regamond is the same as a grain goddess. So you take those things, you whoosh them around a little. Um, but certainly, especially after the Protestant Reformation, there was no image of female at all. Anyone else? Well, thank you so much. I will be signing books. Um, they're $14 a piece. I can take. Um, credit cards or cash or check or anything you like, and I will be doing that right now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.